and welcome to paper 2 module 8 feminist for mothers in this module we will be looking at virginia wolf simone de beauvoir and betty frieden i am professor sarvajit mukherjee from the department of english university of allahabad the generally accepted timeline for the women's movement in the west is that the first wave of feminism enter, ended in 1920 However, Virginia Woolf's most important extended essays on women were all written later in that decade. A Room of One's Own, written in 1929, Three Guineas, written in 1938, and Orlando, in 1928, a novel, all go to prove that far from ending in the 1920s, the women's movement was alive and well till just before the Second World War. Virginia Woolf's writing also show that though the gains made by the first wave of feminism were considerable, a lot yet remained to be done for the women's movement. Socially, Virginia Woolf belonged to that class which would appear to have reaped the full benefit of first wave feminism. Adelaine Virginia Stephen, later Virginia Woolf, was the daughter of Sir Leslie Stephen, and, Prince, and Julia Princep Duckworth, Sir Leslie Stephen, editor, critic, biographer, was very much part of the aristocratic Victorian literary establishment. He was also the founder of the Dictionary of National Biography. The Stevens were either related to or intimate with almost all the major literary figures of England of the time. Though not formally educated in her childhood, Virginia Woolf and her brothers and sisters had full access to Sir Leslie Stevens' rich library. Much of her views were formed independently. Virginia Woolf married a civil servant from, from Sri Lanka, then called the Ceylon Civil Services, Leonard Woolf, and with him set up the, the Hogarth Press which was to publish the works of famous modernist writers like T.S. Eliot. Since before her marriage, and certainly after it, Virginia Woolf was part of the famous Bloomsbury Group, a group of writers, philosophers, economists, and artists who lived in and around the Bloomsbury district of London. Virginia Woolf's home was the venue of the famous Thursday meetings when the members of the group got together for informal intellectual discussions. It would appear from the above that Virginia Woolf epitomized all that women of her generation aspired to. Yet, Virginia Woolf's writings prove that for women there was yet a long way to go. One of the greatest insights of feminism is that a text is never innocent or gender neutral. A feminist analysis of literature in any language looks at literature as a mean of means of creating and perpetuating belief systems. Till feminism did not change the rules of the game, it was widely assumed that literature, like the rest of culture, was gender neutral. It was assumed that there were objective means of judging a work of literature, and the best was studied as established canon. If there were very few women represented in the canon, it was simply because women did not write as well as men. Feminist criticism took it upon itself to disprove this assumption, and Virginia Woolf was the first feminist critic to do so. She pointed out that the social and economic restrictions imposed on women make it very difficult for them to write and publish. Feminists argue that the negative representations of women in literature is rooted in and influences actual social conditions. Therefore, it is essential to identify, analyze, and challenge these representations. This is of paramount importance because the representation of women and men in literature becomes a norm to which women and men aspire. Our ideas of masculinity and femininity are largely derived from the literature that we read, which we then seek to replicate and imitate. 
while these became overriding concerns for feminist literary theorists in the 70s, it is Virginia Woolf who first articulated them. Her personal life too embodies many feminist concerns and is worthy of academic interest. Virginia Woolf started writing professionally in 1905. Initially, she started writing from the Times Literary Supplement. Her first novel, The Voyage Out, was published in 1915, and gradually she evolved into one of the major modernist novelists. Her thematic concerns and stylistic complexity put her in the top ranking modernist novelists like James Joyce and E.M. Forrester, the only woman to achieve this distinction. After the Second World War, her reputation declined sharply, only to revive again in the 1970s when she was rediscovered by feminist scholarship. Virginia Woolf's contribution to feminist thought chiefly rests on two essays, A Room of One's Own and Three Guineas, and a novel Orlando, though much of her work is women-centered too. A Room of One's Own is a classic feminist text where Virginia Woolf points out the two major impediments any woman who wishes to be a writer faces, money and space that she can call her own. Woolf lectured at two Cambridge University colleges, Newnham and Girton in October 1928, and A Room of One's Own is an expanded form of those lectures. The extended essay raises many feminist concerns. Woolf points out the drastic difference in the amenities provided in men's colleges as opposed to women's colleges in Cambridge. She comes to the conclusion that the aristocrats of yore, as well as the wealthy merchants of the day, prefer to endow men's colleges. For who wants university educated women? The situation perhaps could have been different had women been allowed to earn money. Perhaps then they would have been, then they would have richly endowed women's colleges and supported higher education for women. But the bitter fact is that throughout history, women have been excluded from making money. Those heiresses who were wealthy enough through money inherited from their male relatives lost it all on marriage because all of a, women's, of a woman's wealth legally became her husband's on marriage. Besides, if women turned to making money like men, would there have been any new generation to populate the colleges? Such considerations do not weigh on the establishment of Cambridge colleges right from the beadle who shoes her off from the turf to the librarian who refuses her entry into the library without a male fellow to the chapel door that opens only to welcome Cambridge dawns. In a room of one's own, Virginia Woolf emphatically states that, and I quote, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction, thereby indicating the connections of literature with economics. She goes on to examine the various prejudices that have hindered women writers and invokes a mythical Judith Shakespeare, Shakespeare's imagined sister, to illustrate the obstacles women writers have faced historically. But Woolf's analysis goes deeper than mere social constraints. Continuing her argument, she points out that the gendered nature of the literary establishment and language itself works against women. She points out that the education system, the publishing industry, literary critics and aesthetics are all male-centered. These aesthetics and values are then touted as universal. Women to adopt these aesthetics and values because they are exposed to no other. Available women's texts are dismissed as trivial, minor or domestic. Women's experience thus rarely enters literature or informs women's reading. Further, the very language available to women is sexist. It does not capture a woman's experience. 
but a woman is constrained to use it if she wants to be accepted by the male-dominated literary establishment. French feminism, which became popular in the 1980s, rearticulates this preoccupation with language, though within the framework of the theoretical complexity of the period. Ecriture feminine, the term for women's writing in French feminism, seeks to create a new woman's language while critiquing patriarchal language. But it was Virginia Woolf who first articulated the unease with male language. Though Woolf does not privilege the feminine over the masculine, in fact she considers the creative mind to be androgynous, she nevertheless developed literary techniques which reveal women's experience and provide an alternative to male perspectives of reality. These techniques are the stream of consciousness and interior monologue. Later feminist scholars would identify interiority as a marker of women's writing, and Virginia Woolf was in, on the vanguard of such writing. Stream of consciousness is a mode of narration which seeks to rep reproduce the continuous flow of a character's mental processes in which sense perceptions mingle with thoughts, memories, and feelings. The interior monologue, on the other hand, denotes that species of stream of consciousness which seeks to present to the reader the rhythm of consciousness as it occurs in a character's mind. This may not be coherent, and the author does not intervene as guide or commentator to interpret it for the reader. Virginia Woolf rejected the notion that all a writer was supposed to do was to string together some interesting episodes and declare it a representation of life. She declared that life was not a series of gig lamps arranged in an orderly fashion. Rather, it was akin to a luminous haze and the challenge of a writer was to represent this. Woolf's novels like Mrs. Dalloway, written in 1925, and To the Lighthouse, written in 1927, are masterly examples of the stream of consciousness. The organizing structure of the plot is minimized by the author. The events narrated are commonplace enough, but what enriches the novel are the abundant auditory and visual impressions combined with the rich mental life of the protagonist. Her novel Orlando is also unique. Devoted to Vita Sackville West, the novel opens, spans, sorry, spans a few centuries and both sexes. Its lesbian subtext and innovative technique place it in a class of its own. It is pertinent to scrutinize the achievement of Wolf in the context of modernism. Modernism and modernist are terms used to express the radical break with the past in terms of forms, concepts, and subjects and style that came to mark the early 20th century, but especially after the First World War. The year 1922 is generally accepted as the acme of modernism, when several experimental works like James Joyce's Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland showed that the war had indeed engendered a radically new sensibility. What was the relationship of this radical new movement with feminism? Unfortunately, the modernist enterprise was almost totally opposed to feminism. The modernist writers equated Victorian writers with a flabby, sentimental effeminacy and sought to pre present modernism as masculine and virile. Some authors were overtly anti-women. For example, in 1909, F.T. Martinet's Futurist Manifesto declared that it would destroy feminism and promote scorn for women. Similarly, the journal The Little Review, which published leading modernist writers like James Joyce and Ezra Pound, carried the tagline, for virile readers only. Another case in point is the gradual transformation of the influential journal The Egoist. The Egoist started as a feminist journal entitled The Free Woman 
a weekly feminist review in 1912 under the editorship, editorship of Dora Marsden. As the journal gained in popularity, the influential modernist writer Ezra Pound, along with some colleagues like Richard Aldington, wrote to the editor suggesting a change of title. The present title they wrote indicated that the journal was devoted to an unimportant reform and therefore needed to be changed. The unimportant reform being referred to was women's suffrage, which was yet to be implemented. Nevertheless, the editor Dora Marsden concurred and the journal was renamed The Egoist and became a vehicle for the propagation of high modernism. The erasure of women authors during the modernist period was so complete that a scholar today can perhaps only name Virginia Woolf as a woman writer in the context of modernism, while others, like Lessing, have only gradually gained recognition with a change in the intellectual climate. This indeed is a marker of Virginia Woolf's achievement. She was very aware of the biases of modernism and its propensity to trivialize and marginalize women's writing. She wrote in a room of one's own, and I quote, it is probable, however, that both in life and in art, the values of a woman are not the values of a man. Thus, when a woman comes to write, she will find that she is perpetually wishing to alter the established values, to make the serious to make serious what appears insignificant to a man and trivial what to him is important. Much has been written about Virginia Woolf's mental instability, but in the context of the onslaught of the literary establishment against her and its mental costs also need to be taken into consideration in any just assessment. Virginia Woolf was born into an extended Victorian family. Her father, Sir Leslie Stephen, was earlier married to the daughter of William Thackeray, a renowned Victorian novelist. He had a daughter from, the, from, his, from this marriage, Minnie, who was mentally disturbed and eventually had to be institutionalized. Virginia Woolf's mother, Julia, had three children from her earlier marriage, George Gerald and Stella Duckworth, while Vanessa, Toby, Virginia and Adrian were the children of Sir Leslie and Julia Stephen. Virginia Woolf was never sent to school. She records with some bitterness in the Three Guineas that all the family resources of most Victorian families was directed towards educating the sons of the family. This was the fate of most gentlemen's daughters. Virginia Woolf and her sisters were lucky that they had free access to Sir, St Sir Stephen's rich library. They were self-educated and both Virginia Woolf and her sister Vanessa Bell became leading figures of the Bloomsbury group. She was also professional who along with her husband established the Hogarth Press. A critic, public speaker and novelist, Virginia Woolf seemed to have achieved it all uh, where women were still struggling to the right for work and the right to vote. However, her childhood, though happy in most, most respects, left her emotionally scarred. The shadow cast by Minnie Stevens' mental disability has already been mentioned. Virginia Woolf was also sexually exploited while still a child by her half-brother, Gerald Duckworth, a fact she honestly records in an essay entitled, A Sketch of the Past, published in 1939. The vulnerability of the girl child, even within the family, is a current topic of great concern, and Virginia Woolf exemplifies the enormous emotional costs of such victimization. Virginia Woolf was always close to women, in fact, the first of her many mental breakdowns was pre pre precipitated by the death of her mother and her half-sister. In quick succession, when Virginia Woolf was in her early teens, thereafter she was emotionally dependent on her sister Vanessa. She has wryly depicted her devotion to Vanessa in her book Flush, 
Flush being the dog of Elizabeth Browning, the poet Robert Browning's wife. Virginia Woolf showed that a feminist reading of literature reveals that the representation of women in literature is gendered. Further, women authors are capable of disrupting the language system of patriarchy by disrupting the syntactical order of language. The growth of, fem of the feminist movement is inseparable from feminist criticism. While earlier feminists concerned themselves with the representation of women in literature, Woolf engages with language itself. She indicates how gender is acquired through language and how women try to subvert this. Simone de Beauvoir. While Virginia Woolf was discovered by feminist scholars, Simone de Beauvoir's influence on the second wave is undisputed. Beauvoir's The Second Sex, published 1949, is a classical feminist text that argues that culturally man is viewed as positive and woman as the negative or the other. The very title emphasizes the secondary status which women have been forced to occupy historically. The second sex begins with facts and myths from history, psychology, biology and literature. These man-made myths from prehistory to the coming of suffrage depict women as passive objects. The greatest insight that de Beauvoir offered was that femininity itself is a cultural construct. As she famously stated, one is not born a woman but becomes one. Beauvoir's abiding influence on feminism can be gauged by the fact that the concerns she raised are being debated even today. For example, the entire issue of sex and gender which informs feminist thought has its roots in the ideas of Simone de Beauvoir. Sex is a biological fact, while gender is a cultural construct. According to feminism, society often arbitrarily identifies a particular sex with a behavior cluster and then coerces everyone to conform to it. So if a womanly woman is supposed to be kind, gentle, timid and so on, but if she does not fit into this model, she is branded a tomboy. Another allied issue is the essentialism debate. De Beauvoir stoutly denied the existence of a feminine essence or the presence of some essentially feminine qualities in a woman. For her, Every so-called womanly quality in a woman is a cultural construct. However, not all feminists were comfortable with the idea that femininity is a negative state and the ideal was to be as much as like a man as possible. They insisted that there is an essential feminine nature and this, has, and this is nothing to be apologetic about. Rather, the female qualities of caring, sharing and nurturing are important and must be privileged over the masculine qualities of dominance, competition and violence. This debate in fact has its roots in the second sex and de Beauvoir's espousal of constructivism or the idea that femininity is culturally constructed. The second sex was translated into English in 1943. It represents an e epic account of women's oppression throughout history. De Beauvoir argues that while there is no physical or psychological reason for this, throughout history and across cultures, women have been treated as inferior. She argues that women's reproductive function is largely responsible for her oppression. It ties women to the domestic sphere, associates her with the body and so with animals and nature. As man feels superior to both nature and animals, he feels superior to woman, an idea later to be elaborated by the ecofeminists. Woman's maternal role is supposed to be her natural destiny and consequently her status has become less than man. The second sex was notorious for its frankness, especially coming at a time when abortion was illegal in most countries. 
de Beauvoir finds marriage an exploitative ar arrangement which reinforces inequality and ties women to domesticity. Excluded from the public sphere, women form male-female bonds that then perpetuates the position of woman as the other. The alternative is the formulation of a female group identity, a sisterhood. This is another idea which infused the second wave of feminism with vigor as reflected in the slogans like sisterhood is powerful. The text has been consistently criticized and sometimes totally dismissed by both male and female scholars. It is to be noted that de Beauvoir was deeply influenced by existentialism. Existentialism may be said to be a literary and philosophical response to the experience of nothingness, anomaly, absurdity, which attempts to discover meaning in and through this experience. Existentialism denies the existence of a preordained human nature. It emphasizes the responsibility of each individual to become a self-governing person. The German philosopher Hegel argued that each conscious being struggles for recognition with every other conscious being and finally arrives at the conclusion that she or he is the essential subject or the self, while all others are inessential. Similarly, for de Beauvoir, man formulates his identity in opposition to woman who is always the other. This attitude permeates human history and thought. She also introduced the concept of transcendence and immanence. A human being is to be judged in terms of liberty. Liberty here means the ability to do more, know more and have more. This liberty has been appropriated by men. Women have been condemned to immanence. Her liberty is limited and bestowed by someone else. Her only achievement lies in producing the next generation. A woman can only free herself by repudiating her reproductive function and seeking transcendence, that is, pursuing philosophy, art, and science through the help of technology. Beauvoir dreams of a utopia where women are set, are set free from their historic bondage by technology. The modern woman for de Beauvoir would be equal to men and empowered by technology. Betty Friedan. American feminism may be said to have started with the American writer Margaret Fuller. Published in 1845, her book, Woman in the 19th Century, is an early feminist text in which Fuller envisaged a cultural androgyny of the future, which would fuse masculine and feminine attributes. However, the work that impacted American feminism the most almost pioneering the second wave of the women's movement in America, is Betty Friedan's classic, The Feminine Mystique. Betty Friedan trained as a psychologist at the University of California. Despite her academic brilliance, Friedan did not opt for a university career, choosing to become a journalist instead. She was associated with some leftist and women's journals as well as commercial magazines directed at women. When Frieden was pregnant with her second child, she was fired from her job as per the prevailing law in America that did not have any provision for maternity leave. Betty Frieden now started freelancing as a journalist but was profoundly dissatisfied with her life as a suburban housewife. This experience motivated her to explore further and for the 15th reunion of Smith College, of which she was an alumna, Frieden circulated a questionnaire to 200 graduates to gauge their experiences of angst and dissatisfaction. These responses led her to elaborate her research further and the feminine mystique was born. Betty Frieden was a journalist with the magazine Good Housekeeping, and so very familiar with books, 
articles and advertisements directed at women which were available to her professionally. Frieden was uneasy with the unstated assumption of these texts which seemed to suggest that all women were homemakers and or destined to become one. She concluded that middle class white women in the late 1950s were suffering from the problem with no name and angst or psychic distress. They were, they were housewives and consumers with no public careers and expected to have only domestic concerns. Such an existence, according to Frieden, was pushing women to neurosis. This was the mystique which gives the book its name. Frieden attacks women's passive acceptance of cultural stereotypes in her book. Frieden demonstrated that how the white American middle class woman had metamorphosed from the, new, from the feisty new woman of the 1920s and 30s to the confined homemaker of the 1950s. This was in keeping with America's post-war ideology, but for women, this near total dependence for economic, intellectual and emotional support on their husbands was engendering feelings of worthlessness. Frieden's career as a journalist helped her to understand how the media was complicit in generating and perpetuating images of women which, re which reinforced American post-war, Cold War ideology. She concluded that culture is not the cause of women's oppression, rather it is a means through which patriarchal ideology works. Frieden started with meticulous interviews and statistics, which she then used as the rituals of a social group, much as an anthrop anthropologist might. However, the social group is limited to white, heterosexual, middle class and upper class women. This is a severe limitation since it restricts the study of Frieden's book to her own social class. Frieden's intolerant attitudes towards lesbians and her suggestion that sexual relations be sacrificed at the altar of career further date the book. The feminine mystique reads like a book of popular psychology and panders to the American goals of individualism and consumerism. To be fair, Bre Frieden does not set out to theorize about women's issues. She is focused on analyzing the malaise of women's angst seeking causes and suggesting solutions. Betty Frieden was able to consolidate the awareness generated by the feminine mystique and launched into a lifetime's engagement with activism. Not only did she diagnose the problem affecting white middle class women, she moved ahead and tried to deal with them. In 1966, she founded the National Organization of Women, acronymed NOW, which attacked outdated laws which were disadvantages to women. These laws that supported unequal pay for women, denied them maternity leave and daycare facilities were demolished under the immense pressure exerted by NOW. In 1969, Frieden moved against laws banning abortion. She founded the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws, NARAL, and the Women, National Women's Political Caucus in 1971. Earlier, in 1970, she led the immensely successful Women's Strike for Equality. Despite all this, Frieden was cautious about extreme feminist radicalism. She was very concerned that feminism remain a mainstream concern and not become an extreme radical fringe, easily overlooked and dismissed. She was uneasy about what she saw as the lesbian appropriation of feminism. Her book, The Second Stage, published in 1982, advocates a moderate feminism as she identifies the battles won and the ones looming ahead. Frieden died in 2006, leaving America 
more congenial for women after her. Thank you.